Uh, it is um, May of 1971, and I'm finishing my uh, surgical residency uh, at Albany Medical Center, and I get a personal letter from Richard Nixon inviting me to go to Fort Sam Houston on July 5th, where they, I will learn to salute and march, and then I'm going to be sent to Vietnam for the first year of my uh, uh, commitment to the Army. Um, after a month of learning Army talk and Army stuff, um, my wife and I go back to the East Coast. Uh, in the latter part of July, I leave uh, my wife three months pregnant and our three-year-old son at the Philadelphia airport uh, and head west. Uh, three days later, I am at the Da Nang uh, Field Hospital in the northern part of uh, South Vietnam, uh, deep in the jungle. Uh, and that's going to be my home for the next year. Um, the war was still going on in that part of the country at the time, so we were really quite busy. Um, the announcement uh, that uh, casualties were uh, incoming in choppers uh, was uh, made by a kid throwing a basketball against your bedroom door, very high-tech situation. Uh, that was your encouragement to run to the uh, re uh, uh, emergency room. Uh, in, in making that run, we had to go by the airport, the air uh, where they landed these uh, the Chinook helicopters, which are quite large. Uh, when those doors opened, the front third of the uh, Chinook was filled with about 15 or 20 body bags. The back two thirds of the airplane were filled with about 15 to 25 kids. Uh, that had just been uh, blown apart in the previous half hour to two hours. Um, we had six operating rooms. The six most serious patients were uh, taken immediately to those six rooms, uh, and the rest were uh, gotten ready for surgery uh, when, in, when those rooms opened up. The process in the operating room was almost identical for each patient. Uh, there was, for each um, injured injured uh, soldier. There were four separate uh, surgical groups operating, operating on him simultaneously. Uh, orthopedic surgeons were operating on fractured legs or completing amputations. Uh, general surgeons were uh, working on the abdomen and the neurosurgeon and myself were in the head and neck area. Uh, I would help the neurosurgeon retract various lobes of the brain so that he could get to the vessels that were bleeding to cauterize them. When he was finished, uh, I would correct the, uh, uh, fac the, plastic, the facial uh, fractures um, and then use a variety of uh, plastic surgical techniques to cover the uh, uh, large um, the lacerations that, that all these patients had. Uh, these operations usually lasted anywhere from four to six hours, but when they were completed, um, your, your, the day was not over. Uh, there were some four to five other patients who had similar injuries who were going to follow. So we very frequently we operated uh, 24 hours straight, and in many cases, uh, uh, 48 hours straight. Um, at the end of one of those uh, two days, and that, that was with no sleep and a couple of rock hard uh, donuts to keep you going. Um, at the end of one of those uh, two-day uh, sessions in the operating room, uh, three of my friends and I were walking to the uh, tennis court at around 5 a.m. <clears throat> when the kid who was uh, delivered messages for the uh, hospital uh, runs up to me and hands me an envelope. And my first thought was, uh, you know, life is really a bitch. I've had one of the two worst days of my life. Uh, vis-a-vis -vis stress, and now I've got to open an envelope to find out which one of my parents has died. Uh, I opened that envelope only to discover that it announced the birth of our oldest uh, daughter at the time. So my worst day in Vietnam, within milliseconds, became my best, happiest day in Vietnam. Um, when we were through with uh, the operating room, we went back to normal life, which was uh, elective surgery in the morning, running clinics in the afternoon, 
uh, ordering stuff from Japan that you didn't understand how to work, um, dictating letters to your family, uh, and of course, uh, scheduling the next uh, practical joke that you were going to uh, play on one of your uh, friends. Um, but again, uh, it was just a matter of time before the kid with the basketball found your bedroom door and uh, within two days you were right back in the operating room for another uh, several hours. Uh, and that was going to be uh, our existence for the next year. Uh, in our specialty, um, because the larynx is uh, <clears throat> one of our uh, domains, uh, I was asked to do most of the uh, tracheotomies. A, there are two kinds of tracheotomies, an elective, <coughs> which is a short uh, 10 or 15 minute procedure. It's done in the operating room with help, with suction, with cauterization, and with uh, uh, people helping you on the other side of the table. But there's a more uh, serious uh, situation where uh, it has to be done on an emergency basis. Uh, this is usually for uh, soldiers with significant head and neck wounds where, uh, say, you had a fractured jaw with a, a tearing of the soft tissue, the back part of the throat. So the throat quickly filled up with uh, clots and bleeding and swollen tissue. Uh, and when that part of those clots would slide down to the larynx, then you have a patient that can get no oxygen. And that kid's going to die unless you have an opening between his neck and his trachea within about uh, 60 seconds. Uh, this is the kind of thing you rarely see in civilian life. Uh, when, I was, when the lecture was given at Albany Medical Center by the head of uh, head and neck surgery, uh, he, I can remember him saying, this is the kind of thing you never want to do. You're never going to see one. I've never done one and just hope that nobody asks you to do one. So, so with that in mind, um, about three uh, months into my session there, uh, it's about 3 a.m. I'm treating a patient, one of the 15 patients that's just been flown in an hour previously. And a friend of mine who's an anesthesiologist uh, working on a patient in the corner just shouts for me to get over there as fast as possible, which took me about five seconds. But during the five seconds, I kept thinking of that lecture where the guy said, pray that nobody asks you to do this. So I get over to this patient, a young kid who uh, is uh, turning blue. He's starting to convulse. Uh, the nurse looks at me and says, he stopped breathing 15 seconds ago. Uh, I said, what's his injury? Uh, it was a uh, fractured jaw. The bullet had entered uh, one side of his face and, and exited the other side. And then I turned to my friend, the anesthesiologist. Uh, I said, does he have a heart rate? He said, not really. He's got fibrillation, and his oxygen saturation uh, is on the floor. So without even thinking, I just turned to the nurse and asked for a scalpel, the largest scalpel she had. I put my hands on his larynx. That's the voice box. Uh, said a brief uh, prayer asking, asking, prayer, excuse me, uh, asking the big guy in the sky to look over my shoulder, give me a little luck, and, and more importantly, give this little kid, a, this got kid some luck. And um, with my hands there, checking the area about an inch below my uh, fingers, I made a six inch incision from one side of his neck to the other, going about two inches uh, deep. Not, not very pretty, but uh, the hope is that you go deep enough to open up the trachea so you can get a, a tube there, but not deep enough so that you would cut the carotid arteries because all you've accomplished at that time is just killing a patient who's trying to die anyway. So um, I look at the base of the wound. Uh, one of the clues that you're near the trachea is you may see a few bubbles there. I tried to talk myself into uh, that there were uh, some bubbles there. I asked for an endotracheal tube, placed it where the bubbles were, pushed it down about two inches, hoping that it was in the inside of the trachea, but not knowing if it was at the side. And then sitting back and looked at my friend, the anesthesiologist, for him to tell me how we'd done. In the meantime, three other doctors working in the ER that night came over to see 
what was going on because it was a pretty rare item. And uh, we're waiting about 10 seconds for this guy who's, mo who's got no emotion on his face. And my assumption is he's gonna look at me and said, it's too late, he's dead. I waited five, we waited another five seconds. And then with just a minimal smile on his face, the guy was sort of a morose kid. Uh, <laughs> but he, he looks at me and he said, if you're not too busy, take this kid to the OR and fix his jaw, because he's going to make it. Wow. So, wow. so with that, uh, you know, the three other doctors that we're looking at, you know, it, the most thing you get in, a, in an emergency room is, a, you know, maybe a high five or a boy or how to go. But the three guys that came over to watch this semi-disaster, apparent disaster, uh, actually started cheering. I've never heard, I've never had cheering in, uh, in an emergency room, but I was glad to uh, receive it. Um, so as I pushed the uh, stretcher to the OR to uh, reduce this guy's fracture, I didn't have any thoughts about how great it was that this happened or anything. My thought was with the Pentagon, sounds strange, but it, there's a connection here. Um, <laughs> I thought to myself, five minutes earlier, somebody in the Pentagon was getting ready to send this kid's parent a, le a letter that would say, uh, we, regret, we regret to inform you that uh, on this date, your son uh, was killed valiantly defending Hill number 42. Uh, please accept our sympathy. But now, um, I'm in the operating room and we're just about uh, <coughs> ready to uh, start with the reduction of his, of his uh, facial fracture, and I thought, some kid in the OR is going to have to be really unique because this is going to be <clears throat> a very uh, personal letter. Uh, I don't know how they'd say it, but the meat of it would be, uh, your son received a, a non-lethal injury uh, on this date. Um, his fractured uh, jaw uh, has been repaired. Uh, he's going to uh, be sent back to the States in three days. Um, six weeks from now, the wires keeping his jaws together uh, will be removed. Uh, and on that date, most of these kids are tired of a, a liquid, soft diet, so please buy him a few steaks. <laughs> so, yeah, in summary, I'd like to say I was, uh, oh, uh, 15 years later, uh, my wife and I were, were in Washington, D.C., and I got up early in the morning to... Uh, go to the, the wall to uh, just to get a look at it because it was getting a lot of play. I went in the morning because I didn't want uh, anybody to see me crying at the wall. When you go there at 6, there's 1,200 people that had the same idea, and they're all in tears, so you just don't care. You just go. But I made a point out of uh, going to the exact spot on the wall where that kid's name would have been, but it never made the wall because... We, we both got lucky. And in retrospect, I'd like to say I, was, uh, I worked with a great team of uh, surgeons at uh, Da Nang, very competent, very dedicated, and they knew how to hustle when you had to hustle, and uh, I was very proud to be on that team. Thank you.